by just sharing with someone next to you what you are grateful for this morning. If you think of your life, you think of the past week, what are you grateful for being here today? So, you're talking about what you are grateful for. Is there anyone who would like to share what they are grateful for this morning? And um, we know that there are often people listening online, so welcome to you too. And uh, if you want to share what you are grateful for, if you don't mind talking over the mic so that those tuning in from home are able to hear as well. Let's start here in, in the front. We usually end here, but let's start here in the front. Is there anyone leading us in worship today that want to share what they are grateful for? I'm grateful for my health because I'm an old guy now. <laughs> hey, Les had his birthday yesterday. Congratulations. So what constitutes? Are you 50 yesterday? 49. Okay. Anyone else? What are you grateful for? Answered prayer. Answered prayer. Wilson? We're so blessed to live in a safe country. And I'm blessed to have a dog that gets me out walking every day. Dog that gets you walking every day. Sorry. Blessed to be in a country where you're safe to worship as you want and as you please. And I'm so grateful for Linda. Grateful for Linda, okay, okay. Is it, yeah, Valentine's Day is in a few days, but, you know, it's good that you're getting things started, yeah? I'm very grateful for friendship. Very grateful for friendship, that's beautiful, Katie? Grateful for great friends from age of seven, and also going to the Christian conference yesterday, Lou Fellingham, it was very good. Good, friendship. Good input, conferences, one or two more things. Just grateful for this day to come and worship the Lord. Grateful for the day to worship the Lord. Grateful that spring's coming, the nights are getting lighter and blossom is on the trees. I actually am. It's super excited. Brilliant. So many things to be grateful for. So part of why we're here today is to give God thanks and to worship Him as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. So that is what we will do today, is glorify God. Friends, just one or two notices. We have more birthdays this week. Morag isn't in yet, but she's got her birthday on Monday. So if you see her on Monday, you're very welcome to congratulate her. Tracy Henderson has her birthday on Tuesday. And someone that's actually here, who's got their birthday on Thursday, is Lloyd. Yay! Yay. Well done. Good. So, um, let's just start by, um, by praying together. Um, yeah, let's just open our hearts and open our, our ears and our eyes to what the Lord wants to share with us this morning. God of love, we lift up our eyes, scanning the horizon. Where does our help come from? Jesus, our hope, we lift up our voices, praising your name. Our help comes from the Lord. Spirit, our guide, we lift up our hearts, seeking your presence. Maker of heaven 
and earth. Lord, we do bow before you today, knowing that you know about every care and concern we might have being here. We might feel a bit bruised or battered or broken. Come and fill us afresh with your goodness. Replace our sorrow with joy and with everlasting grace. Minister to us, Holy Spirit, through your word and through our time of worship. And as we share communion later, Lord, may you come and, and enter into that mysterious place to reveal to us what it means to be a follower of Jesus, to be sanctified and to be purified and to be led alongside our majesty, King Jesus. In your glorious name we pray. Amen. Let us now worship God. Before we worship God, I'll say I'm very grateful to our talented young people who drive the tech every week um, in both services. Uh, they do a great job. Um, <clears throat> we're going to sing one song just now. If you're able to join with us, if you're able to stand and sing, that would be nice. Uh, we're going to sing, I, I love you, Lord, for your mercy never fails me. Of the 
of the goodness of God. I will sing of the goodness of God. Morning, folks. Good news for you. And I'm going to read it in Hebrews 4 before I pray. Eric referred to this last Sunday, actually. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to feel sympathy for our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet he did not sin. Last Sunday, Eric spoke about the temptation of Jesus, who knows what it's like. So, the good news is, let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. So let's approach that throne of grace with confidence. Just take a minute to get your head into that space. And remember that when we pray, Jesus hears our prayers. And if we're not quite sure how to say it, the Holy Spirit interprets it and offers it to God. So let's pray. Father God, we often don't know what to pray for the way we ought to, but thank you that the Holy Spirit takes our prayers and makes them acceptable to you, and that's great. So we come to you in our weakness, and we look for your grace and mercy because we're always in need. So Lord, today, we thank you for being here we thank you that we are here under the sound of your word and we'll be celebrating the death of Jesus who shed his blood and gave his life for us. And we pray that you will accept our offering as a sacrifice of praise. Lord, we have much to thank you for as came out earlier in our meeting. And as we give you thanks for all these positives in our life, we know that you are with us throughout all our need, and we ask for your blessing and your grace and mercy for people who particularly need it at the moment within our congregation. Some people are ill. Others are depressed. Some are wondering how to make ends meet. Some are worried about their families. And Lord, we commit them all to you and we pray that you will share your grace and mercy with them. Thank you for this community we live in. And we pray that you will make us aware of people in our community who need us to reach out to them. Pray that this week you will give us all a prompt to find someone that we can bless in this community. And Lord, we pray for our nation. We're in a state of flux at the moment. The SNP are looking for a leader who will be first minister. And Lord, you know the issues. And we bring to you the fact that your name appears to have been rejected by many in this reach for power. And we ask, Lord, that your name will still be honored in the appointment of whoever becomes First Minister. And Lord, we, we commit to you all the stuff that's happening in the world. There are wars not just in Ukraine, but most of Africa seems to be at war. And Lord, we ask that you will bless your people who are caught up in the middle of all that. And Lord, you know all the things that are in our heart, and I don't want to list them here. But we pray your blessing 
upon us today. And Lord, we want your kingdom to come. In fact, let's just say that Lord's Prayer together. That's the phrase in it that always gets me, your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. So let's say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the, and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you. We're going to continue in worship. Um, we're going to sing Living Hope. And again, if you're able to stand with us. Set me 
free, hallelujah. Death has lost his grip on me, you have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah, praise the one who set me free, hallelujah. His grip on me, you have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Oh, God, you are my living hope. say amen to that. We are children of the living God. Thank you that you reassure us time and time again, Lord, that that is who we are ultimately, is your kin, and nothing will separate us from your everlasting love for us. Thank you, Jesus, for your life in exchange for ours. We are your children. We are your children. We are your children. 
Thank you, Lord. Amen. Can I ask Linda to do our readings for this morning? Our first reading. Our first reading comes from Numbers 21, verses 4 to 9. It's called the Bronze Snake. They travelled from Mount Hor along the route to the Red Sea to go round Edom. But the people grew impatient on the way. They spoke against God and against Moses and said, Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There's no bread, there's no water. And we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent venomous snakes among them. They bit the people and many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We sinned when we spoke against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord will take the snakes away from us. So Moses prayed for the people. The Lord said to Moses, Make a snake and put it up on a pole. Anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. So Moses made a bronze snake and put it up on a pole. Then when anyone was bitten by a snake and looked at the bronze snake, they lived. And our second reading comes from the book of John. John chapter 3, verses 1 to 17. Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you're doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born again. How can anyone be born when they're old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, You must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. You are, a, are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and you do not understand these things. Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen. But still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Amen. And may God add his blessing to this reading of his holy word, and to him be all glory, honor, and praise. So this is always a good environment to challenge one another. So I want to ask you, in just two or three minutes, in groups of two or three, just chat about what does it mean to be born again. 
This whole passage speaks about rebirth. What does it mean to be rebirthed as Christians in light of what we have just read here? Again, there's no real wrong answer here. Maybe you can speak from a, an experience you had to be born of water and spirit, um, to be born from above, as one translation states it. So just in two or three minutes, just have a bit of a chat, and um, then we'll give an opportunity for some feedback as well. What does it mean to be reborn? Okay, we're going to give two or three people just an opportunity. If you would like to share what you said, you're welcome to. If you want to reflect on what someone else said, you're also welcome to. In terms of rebirth, what does it mean to be reborn? According to this passage and maybe some other passages that came to mind as you were having a chat. So... Um, I see it's the classic avoiding eye contact situation, talking to myself here. So, anyone? Listen, I still can't understand. When do you say you're born again? When do you know you're born again? These, these are the questions I've been discussing. Oh, sorry. Since you're a child, I've always had the faith. I've always believed. It's never changed. We set out to lead a decent life, not always perfect, but we know the rules. We know how we're meant to be as Christians. And that's as far as I can go with it, really. I don't know where the born... I don't quite get the born again. I've discussed it before with somebody, and I still don't quite get it. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. That's probably the best response you could have in sharing that it is something that you're wrestling with, 
something that you are grappling with. And it's something that we'll hopefully dip into today as well as reminding one another that a, a process of rebirth is something that continues throughout life. For many people, there is a moment when they commit themselves to the Lord. And for some, they grew up in a Christian home. So for many, it's a difficult thing to say there's a specific date. For others, it's different. Lloyd, do you want to share? Yeah, it's interesting. It is, it is a bit of a mystery, isn't it? It's hard to understand because I guess it's something that happens to you. Like when you get born like in the flesh, you don't sort of have a big part to play. You just sort of pop out. It's other people doing that to you. And it's like it's, it's, the new birth is the same. It's, it's, it's a work of God. It's an act of God. And so there's something in that, that that's mysterious. Like what, what happened there? But there is a sense that something has happened. I think that's, that's the key thing. I'm just going to read out this verse from Galatians. Um, Galatians 1 verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ. So it's like something happened to me on the cross. I died when he died. Something in me died. My old life is, is no longer applicable. It's like I don't like that stuff anymore. I hate it. Um, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So I guess there's this, this, this new life that I start living that's lived for God. It's weird. I no longer want that old stuff. And I live by faith, something that I never used to do before. I used to have to live by sight. I had to know things beforehand. I had to use logic, and that must work out. I must have money in the bank before I go off to do that. And suddenly God calls me to do something and there's no money and he says go and I say okay I'll go and there's a sense that we live by faith not by sight and we, we, we trust God that he's, he's faithful that he died for us when we were still sinners how much more then will he not you know love us and and you know pour all his blessing on us now that we're his and so it's a remarkable thing and yeah I think this this morning service has really been set up for that just that the worship was incredible getting us to think about whose we are not so much about who we are but whose we, we belong to someone that's really a good way to look at it thank you lord so let's let's do that just now let's look at the passage and um it remains a challenging piece of scripture but there is truth and a lot of truth to be found in here. So for a moment, just imagine the scene. We have a prominent Jewish leader, and he sneaks out at night to have a debate on Hebrew scriptures. I didn't know this, is that often the Jewish leaders would, at night, they would have a bit of a brew or a nice glass of wine. I don't think they had whiskey back then, and then they would discuss the Talmud or the Torah. And so Nicodemus goes out to have a chat with Jesus. He is a little bit cautious. For the same guy that turned water into wine in chapter 2 a little bit earlier is the same guy who cleared the temple with a corded whip. And he says, get out of here. How dare you turn my father's house into a market? And Nicodemus is saying, well, I need to be cautious because what will people say? What will be the chat, the gossip around time if they see me talking to Jesus? Still, something draws him out. He must have an encounter with a miracle worker. Nicodemus recognizes that something is different about Jesus. And he's willing to take that risk by interacting with Jesus. He's heard the stories, he's seen the signs, and he acknowledges it before Jesus saying, You are a teacher. He says, You are from God. How else would you be able to perform these miraculous signs? Jesus then enters the discourse by responding indirectly to Nicodemus' statement. And he says, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is, as we said earlier, born again. Nicodemus is a little bit caught off guard for two reasons. Firstly, because he is part of the Sanhedrin. He is adhering to the strictest laws and regulations He's made so many sacrifices to get 
his credentials. And then here's this rabbi saying, it's not enough. In fact, it's pretty much useless unless you are born again. Secondly, as a member of the Jewish ruling council, he was compelled to marry. He probably had one, two, maybe more children, and he might have been present, or he might not have been present at his child's birth. There were midwives back then as well, but he definitely had that chat with his brother or the midwife, the type we all have when the nurse preps us for what's going to happen. Back then, the umbilical cord was cut, and then the baby was washed in salt or wine, which have an antiseptic property, and rubbed with olive oil to soothe the skin. Friends, we know childbirth can be messy, and it entertains the imagination of Nicodemus. Hence, his response. He says, you want all of that to happen in reverse. How can these things be? How can these things be? It's interesting. These are Nicodemus' final words in this passage. He does not understand Jesus, or he chooses not to understand. Later, we hear that Nicodemus defended Jesus, and he assisted him at his burial. At some point, the light will dawn for him. And friends, if we're honest, if we are very honest and we do a bit of introspection, we'll admit that we're often befuddled or mystified by God. We just saw an example of that now. But it always leads to greater things. It always leads to greater things. What does Jesus do? He sees this guy is struggling a bit, so he's going to assist him. Makes it easier for him by paraphrasing. You can enter and only enter the kingdom of God unless you are born of water and spirit. He says it differently. And then he says, well, I'm going to help you even more, connect the dots even more. And he takes him back to the Old Testament, that which he is so familiar with that he knows. And he says, just as Moses, in verse 14, lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. That everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. And so the Israelites did what the Israelites did best in the wilderness. They grumbled and they moaned. Like most, most church folk today as well. Something we do well. They say we detest the food. We don't like the water. We want to go back to Egypt. What happens? Venomous snakes enter the camp. A lot of people are bitten. They die. They come to their senses. They repent and ask for Moses to intercede on their behalf and to ask God to provide the solution. What do we get? A bronze snake on a pole. Look up or gaze upon this symbol and you will be saved from dying. I don't know if you've seen this symbol before. The this is a flag. This is actually the World Health Organization's flag from the United Nations. But you've all seen this on many, maybe even ambulances before. And it has its roots in this very story we read this morning. It's no incident, friends, that these verses come directly after the comparison of the Son of Man and the serpent on the poles. It's healing and restorative power. So let's look at some of the parallels between the Moses story and the Jesus story. In both cases, the people are in danger of death because of their sin, their grumbling, their rebellion. Secondly, God provides the agent of salvation, the bronze serpent in the first story, and then the son of man in the second. Thirdly, the agent of salvation is lifted up. It's probably the deepest point of connection between the bronze snake and Jesus being lifted up. And then lastly, the people are saved by looking at or believing in the agent of salvation. Two differences, two big and significant differences though. The bronze snake was only a piece of bronze. 
didn't have any saving power. When uh, the Israelites began to make offerings to the bronze serpent, treating it as an idol, King Hezekiah destroyed it. Jesus, however, is invested with saving power and is worthy of our worship. And then secondly, looking at the lifted up bronze snake gave the Israelites extended physical life. Looking up at the lifted up, Jesus gives us eternal life. And this term lifted up has quite a multiple amount of meanings in the gospel. It refers to Jesus' cross, yeah, but it also refers to his resurrection, his ascension, and also his glorification. Jesus compares himself to the bronze serpent that the Israelites had faith in to save them. Jesus is our redemption and our faith in him will give us eternal life, hope and release from condemnation, not just for us, but for the whole world, for the whole world. Let's maybe look at verse 16 and 17, and let's just say it out together. It's a, it's a familiar verse. Many of you know it off by heart. Let's say it together. For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through Him. To save the world. I love this Greek word, sozo, to save, because it means so much more than just to save. It means to rescue, it means to heal, it means to restore, to complete, to make whole. What an absolute game changer. It's incredible. This must have shook Nicodemus' world. The dissatisfaction with a life filled with impossible rules and regulations. A life where you effectively save yourself finds hope in that statement. You can't save yourself, Jesus is saying. You don't have to. The one that will be elevated in your place, to die in your place, to ransom you, to take your penalty to the cross. Nicodemus cannot fully comprehend the how, but he can know the why. God's love is the why. God's purpose is love. God's motive is love, and God's objective is salvation. The Spirit works as the Spirit chooses because of love. None of it is forced love. Jesus' famous words constructed as a purpose statement. God's intent is clear, friends. I want to enter and I want you to enter into a living and thriving relationship with me. And I was willing to give my son to die in your place, to make a way for you to be reconciled to the love of the Father. Friends, that is eternal life. Eternal life for us. Shaped by an utter dependence on God. It's not simply life in heaven after you die. It begins now in this very moment when believers entrust their lives to Jesus. And it's interesting because this word to have is in the present tense. Suggesting that Believers possess it in the here and now rather than having to wait for it as some future inheritance. And friends, this is the first time Jesus speaks about eternal life. It's referenced 17 more times in the Gospels, in this specific Gospel, and 15 more times by Jesus. But still, for Nicodemus, it is a very hard teaching. He finds it difficult to accept. He probably went home and wrestled with it for nights. Maybe had sleepless nights because of it. Why? Because this good news of the gospel isn't necessarily good news to Nicodemus. He has invested a lifetime ritual in holiness. Yet, he has seen the power of Jesus. It obviously comes from God. It has to. 
Christ is telling him that this world has changed because of Jesus, and he has to change with it. He must be born again to see the kingdom of God. I wonder maybe today if there's anything that you can think of that you need to relearn in your own capacity as a follower of Jesus Christ. Maybe you've reached a point in your life where you feel like there's not really a lot more that I can learn in life. Usually when we reach that point, it means that we probably need to unlearn a few things that we've gotten used to. In the same way that Nicodemus was so convinced that this teaching of the Torah and the Talmud and the law was the only way for things to be made right with God. And Jesus confronts him in the middle of the night. He kind of just goes and he's not sure why he's going. He's curious because he's heard all these miraculous stories of Jesus. There's a sense of expectation and anticipation as he talks to Jesus. Maybe he thought, you know, morally speaking, it doesn't get better than this. Being self-righteous, probably wanting to hear Jesus, encouraging him in what he was doing, abiding to the laws. And Jesus says, pal, you've got it all wrong. You can't save yourself. There's a few things that you need to unlearn. I wonder if there are things that you and I, we need to unlearn. I don't know what it is. I can think of a few things that we've become accustomed to in the tradition that we find ourselves in, in the culture that we are in, thinking that we can still save ourselves. Maybe, like me, you've at times created your own bronze serpent, putting it up on high, thinking these things are able to save me. If I'm just a better person, if I'm just able to serve in a better capacity, if I can just do more home visitations, if I can just give more than a tenth of my income, I will be able to be saved. No, that's not what it means. To be born again means to relinquish and to pour ourselves out, increasing God's capacity to fill us anew and afresh. And I so appreciate what John also said and referenced in his prayer in saying that is part of the Christian journey is that we will never arrive at the place it's always a journey for us but our faith is secure Jesus has come to save us from eternal damnation we have eternal life in the here and now that is what we do when we form part of Lent is we reorientate ourselves towards God's grace and holiness. And that's what we do every time we eat of the bread and we drink of the wine. We are reminded that we belong to God and that He paid the ultimate price for that relationship. And there's so much mystery in it. But by God's grace, He allows us to grasp enough of it to just say, Lord, I accept. I accept Your grace and Your forgiveness for me. Nothing can separate me and everyone else who believes in You. We have eternal life because of what Jesus has done for us. May you journey with that. May you journey with this story in this week. And may it transform you more and more into Christ's likeness. Amen. Let us just pause, friends, for a few moments. And, and, and I feel very seriously about <clears throat> we have access to so many different ways of connecting with God. But I feel very strongly today that there might be things that we need to unlearn. There are so many courses that you can attend where you're able to soak up other people's insight and wisdom. But along the way, 
as human beings being fickle. We sometimes pick up habits in our daily routine or ways of thinking that we need to get rid of. And so I pray for you just now, in that moment where you are, if there are certain things that you need to let go of, to once more embrace your salvation, that the Holy Spirit reveal that to you. Like Nicodemus, we all have things to unlearn, to enter anew into this process of being reborn. In a, in a moment or two of just silent prayer, we pray that the Holy Spirit will show these things to you in a picture or in an image. And that you will respond to that in the best way possible. Amen. We are now going to hand out the elements. How we've done it previously is we invite you to come to the front. And those elders who will be here will give you a piece of bread or they will just offer you the plate and you're welcome to take a piece of bread and there's some juice or wine ask you to just hold on to the elements, the bread and the wine or juice and take it back to your seat after you've received it here in front um, and then we will take them together. So the worship band will lead us in a song when I survey the wondrous cross and during the song we invite you to come forward to receive the elements and to just keep it with you on the table in front of you. i 
touch my soul, my life, my But God is incredibly imaginative. There is a surprise in this bread. For within each crumb, God has enfolded nothing less than heaven. And when we break it, and everyone has a piece, what we are doing is saying, let's share together the story of Jesus. It looks like a goblet of wine and it is wine but God being God didn't leave it there and he has squeezed into each drop a promise for the whole world and when we pass it among us and everyone has a taste it sort of whispers to our souls and sort of tangles with memories telling us God loves us God loves us God loves us completely fully holy so let us break bread as we listen to the story jesus said to them i assure you unless you eat the flesh of the son of man and drink his blood you have no life in you whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life and i will raise them up at the last day my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in them. As the Father living sent me and I because of the Father, so whoever eats me lives because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. It isn't like the bread your ancestors ate and then they died. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. Let us respond to that with a sorsum corda. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Here is bread torn and offered to you a symbol of Christ's love today. Here is wine poured out for you, a sign of the lavish gift of God. By these signs, remember God born for us, light and life for the world, to give us hope for an everlasting life. Eat, drink, 
and know that Jesus was lifted on high to pay the price for your freedom. This cup symbolizes the new covenant in Christ. Drink and remember all of you. Lord, we cannot thank you enough. Our hearts are overflowing with gratitude when we take these elements and we think of your Son and what he's given for us. Lord, thank you. Thank you for rebirth. Thank you for the opportunity of being reborn. We know it came at the dearest price. Thank you for salvation. And thank you for restoring our broken hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Let us now share that peace with one another. Peace be with you. Friends, let us conclude our time of worship today <clears throat> by singing No Longer Slaves. You unravel me with a melody. You surround me. 
song of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone I'm no longer a slave to fear I am a child of God I'm no chosen me love has called my name I've been born again into your family your blood flows through my veins I'm no longer a slave to fear I am a child May you know the presence of God our Keeper with us by day and by night, with us in our coming and going, with us from this time on and forevermore. Amen. <laughs> 